13. Drunk Deadbeat vs. Enraged Dad A wild face-off between two British men in the town of Bushy, Hertfordshire went viral in October of 2018, thanks to a quick-thinking bystander who captured the incident on camera. The ordeal began when a father noticed a sloppy drunk man urinating on his fence, prompting him to go outside and confront the stranger. But instead of politely going away, the drunkard became argumentative. In the background, a woman could be heard yelling at the man for upsetting her child, who was crying and clearly upset by the situation. During the heated exchange of words, the drunk man ripped open his button-down shirt, removed it, and then challenged the homeowner to a fight. Without warning, the homeowner knocked the offending party out in one fell swoop, delivering a debilitating blow to the man's head. He could be heard yelling, I effing warned you, as he kicked the stranger, who by that point was lying face down on the ground. A local police spokesperson confirmed police were called to the scene shortly before 9am in response to a reported disturbance. No arrests were initially made, and the agency said it was reviewing the viral footage following its appearance on social media. By then, it was clear that the homeowner had won in the court of public opinion, with commenters praising him for protecting his family. They also said that he handled the urinating stranger with impressive swiftness and efficiency. 12. An Unlikely Victory In a shocking fistfight between two young women that was captured on camera in 2018, a petite cheerleader from California responded to a much larger girl's challenge to a fight by unexpectedly rising to the occasion. Bystander footage showed the pint-sized teen, identified by social media users as Savannah Sprague, ruthlessly pummeling her adversary in the presence of several other teenagers. In the 92-second clip, the larger girl could be heard saying, do you want to fight, as she stood over Sprague and pointed her finger in the smaller woman's face. Sprague responded by saying that nobody wanted to fight the girl and her friends, and that they were the ones who were trying to start problems. She also said that nobody had been talking about the angry young woman's group. Tensions escalated as the girl who seemed to be looking for a fight failed to back off, prompting Sprague to warn her opponent not to touch her. Moments later, the unidentified bully slapped Sprague in the face, only to be quickly overpowered by her victim. At one point during the video, Sprague could be seen on top of the other girl as she delivered one blow after another to her face and back. But just as soon as it started, the fight was over. However, the footage gained legendary status on social media, where Sprague's older sister praised her for defending herself against the bully. Abraham Gill You've likely heard of diplomatic or consular immunity, which protects diplomats and their loved ones from prosecution in a foreign country under circumstances where an average person would most likely face charges. But it's not given automatically, as the son of an Israeli diplomat learned in early 2024 when he was accused of striking a cop with his motorcycle. 19-year-old Abraham Gill allegedly ran over an officer who was conducting a traffic stop on another driver in Sunny Isles Beach, Florida. The cop suffered a leg injury, and Gill was charged with resisting an officer with violence and aggravated battery of a law enforcement officer. During Gill's bond hearing, his defense attorneys argued that he was entitled to consular immunity due to his dad's status as a diplomat. But the U.S. State Department denied immunity to the teen. They clarified in a statement that Gill isn't entitled to civil or criminal protection from prosecution. The incident came after a prior run-in with the law on New Year's Eve in 2023, when Gill was pulled over in Miami shores for speeding and making an illegal turn. In police body cam footage of the traffic stop, he could be heard asking the officer if he could call his father. But he's now learning the hard way that his dad can't rescue him from his legal problems. 10. Kevin Boyle for some people, a little bit of power can be an incredibly self-destructive thing. This certainly appears to be the case for Pennsylvania State Representative Kevin Boyle, who went viral in early 2024 for verbally assaulting employees at a bar in Rockledge. The 44-year-old politician's outburst occurred at the Gall & Co. Malthouse, where an onlooker recorded footage of Boyle berating staff members. 
Boyle also allegedly threatened and insulted customers at the popular bar in Montgomery County, where he erupted into a tirade shortly after midnight. In the video, he could be heard calling people idiots, morons, traitors, and actors. He reportedly threatened to shut down the bar and said that he would prevent someone from being promoted at their job in the US military. He also hit multiple female employees, and that's when the bouncer dialed 911. According to law enforcement, a responding officer found Boyle standing outside the bar. He handed over his driver's license, but allegedly refused to provide any more information. Staff members told police that Boyle was intoxicated and that they suspected him of being on drugs due to his explosive behavior. They also claimed that Boyle's tantrum began after he was told to leave the bar. He had refused to comply, but he didn't put up a fight when the officer told him that he was banned from the property. Boyle left on foot, and the atmosphere at the bar undoubtedly calmed down. But the worst was yet to come for the disgraced politician. After all, it's common knowledge that if you throw a fit in public, it's almost guaranteed to be captured on video. In addition to being turned over to investigators, the footage was posted on social media. This ensured that Boyle would be held accountable in the court of public opinion, even if he managed to avoid criminal charges. A spokesperson for the Pennsylvania House Democratic leaders acknowledged the troubling nature of the video and said that Boyle has been open about his personal challenges. The statement went on to say that Boyle was seeking help and that the group was committed to ensuring that mental health services were available to its members. But this wasn't the first time Boyle made news headlines for his controversial actions. In 2021, he was charged with harassment for allegedly violating an order to refrain from abusing his wife. Shortly after his arrest, Boyle's attorney told NBC10 that his client wasn't accused of any violent acts and that Boyle was scheduled for a mental health evaluation. The lawyer further stated that Boyle planned to comply with any mental health treatment that was recommended by the evaluator. It's been two years since news of Boyle's alleged mental health struggles first came to light, and his recent outburst certainly begs the question of whether he's truly serious about getting help. Only time will tell, and for now, Boyle's colleagues remain sympathetic, while members of the public have taken a less forgiving tone. 9. Entitled Couple Demands Buy to Get One Deal in one of the latest cases of obnoxious and entitled passengers disrupting air travel, a couple demanded a free upgrade to first class for their child on a Chinese flight from Chengdu to Beijing. According to fellow passengers, the plane was waiting to depart from Chengdu when the couple's young son began sobbing in the economy section of the aircraft. The boy's parents were seated in first class and his father confronted staff members. He argued that because he and his wife had paid for two upgrades, they deserved a third upgrade on the house. Crew members, security guards, and even fellow passengers tried to explain to the irate man that his son wasn't entitled to a free seat in first class, but he refused to listen to reason. Footage captured by an onlooker showed the enraged father berating pretty much everyone around him as they tried to talk sense into him. Nobody could get through to him, though. A security guard tried to calm down the man, who instead became even more intense and challenged the guard's right to order him around. The unnamed man's temper tantrum caused a three-hour delay, which ultimately led to the flight being cancelled entirely, much to the dismay of his nearly 300 fellow travelers. While the cancellation was blamed on the weather, many witnesses suspected that it had more to do with the unruly passenger's behavior, and they were probably right. Social media users agreed, with many commenters admonishing the infuriated dad for his selfish and inconsiderate behavior. 8. Eugene Matusevich 34-year-old Eugene Matusevich became irrationally livid when he received a ticket for making an illegal U-turn in Bethesda, Maryland in 2018. Even after going to court, paying a $50 fine and avoiding a conviction, he couldn't let go of his anger. 
Instead of moving on with his life, Eugene tracked down the personal cell phone number and social security number of Officer Dominic Stanley, who issued the ticket. He barraged the cop with at least 25 taunting text messages, calling him names like Fat Boy and asking if he was on a donut break or applying for welfare. In one message, Eugene mocked Dominic for driving a Honda Civic and bragged about his BMW, saying, no wonder you hate people like me with nice cars. In addition to flooding Dominic with unwanted correspondence, Eugene allegedly gave the officer's name and phone number to drug rehab facilities, who called the officer, thinking he was interested in receiving treatment. At one point throughout the harassment, Dominic sent Eugene a text message instructing him to cease and desist. Dominic replied with a promise to stop, only to follow it up with more insults and a snarky correction of a word that Dominic had misspelled. Eugene took his harassment campaign even further by contacting the officer's father on social media, stating that his son was a glorified mall cop and sarcastically adding, you must be so proud. Most people don't get away with talking to the police like that, and Eugene was no exception. Authorities charged him with three counts of obscene misuse of a phone and one count of harassing electronic communication, which are all misdemeanors that could carry a total of up to 10 years in prison. The case went viral, and Eugene was quick to change his attitude, especially after losing two jobs due to the negative publicity he received. He got himself into anger management and psychotherapy and performed over 75 hours of community service without being ordered to do so. He likely did this with the hope of proving to the court that he was remorseful and capable of change. After pleading guilty to the harassing communication charge, he apologized profusely for his actions. Eugene also wrote an apology letter to Officer Dominic and was sentenced to 18 months of probation. 7. Daniel Khalif Every now and then, a wanted fugitive becomes overly confident in their ability to elude law enforcement, and in many cases, it ends up backfiring. Such was the case for 21-year-old terrorism suspect Daniel Khalif, who sparked a multi-day manhunt after escaping from a British prison in September of 2023. 75 hours into the search, an undercover police officer spotted Khalif in plain view at a public park in northwest London on a busy Saturday morning. He was sitting on a bicycle with a sleeping bag nearby, seemingly unconcerned about the possibility of being identified and captured. The officer and several other undercover cops approached the fugitive with guns drawn and warned him not to move or they would shoot. In what seemed like a split second, dozens of police vehicles descended on the scene, making it clear that the wanted prisoner had no chance of escaping from custody this time. Khalif could be heard screaming that he didn't do anything wrong and that the cops had the wrong man as they wrestled him to the ground. At the same time, he allegedly glanced over at 20-year-old Ethan Andrews, who was watching the takedown as it unfolded and winked at the bystander. Andrews later told reporters that Khalif started laughing in the middle of his arrest in what could only be described as a disturbing display of arrogance. But it wasn't long before Khalif stopped acting obnoxious and was overcome by a defeated expression, according to another witness, who said that it was evident that the fugitive was unhappy about his fate. On top of the terrorism charges he was already facing, he was hit with additional counts related to his escape. Two of the prison's guards were fired from their jobs for contributing to the security shortcomings that led to Khalif's escape, which in theory should reassure the public that another incident like this is unlikely to occur. But the escape happened amid a dire shortage of guards at the overpopulated prison, which appears to be an ongoing problem in the facility. Since then, dozens of inmates have been transferred to other jails as an additional measure to prevent history from repeating itself. 6. Antonio Bitti Accused killer Antonio Bitti made news headlines across the US in 2018 when he smiled and stuck his tongue out to the victim's family in the middle of a court hearing. Prosecutors accused Beatty of fatally shooting 25-year-old Carlton Whitley in a parking lot in Wilmington, North Carolina. He showed no remorse afterward, stating that the family was lucky he didn't do more than that. 
The murder weapon was never recovered, but an eyewitness allegedly identified Beatty as the shooter, and authorities claim the DNA evidence placed him at the scene. From the very beginning of the case, Beatty adamantly maintained his innocence. But his distasteful courtroom display, which happened during his very first hearing, didn't exactly paint him in a favorable light. Beatty's uncle, Anthony, apologized to Whitley's family during an interview with local station WECT, stating that his nephew's behavior didn't reflect the man that he knew, who he described as a good guy who steered clear of trouble. Anthony admitted that Beatty's loved ones didn't know if he committed the shooting, but insisted that the crime would have been totally out of character for the suspect. The case dragged its heels through the court system for the next seven years, as it encountered one delay after another, prolonging the suffering of everyone involved. Beatty repeatedly refused to take a plea deal, saying that he didn't want to admit to something he didn't do. Eventually, the case went to trial in 2022. His attorney, Bill Paragoy, argued that the murder scene was pitch dark at the time of the shooting, making it extremely difficult for a witness to reliably identify a suspect. One of the state's star witnesses backed out of testifying at the 11th hour, and Paragoy would later tell WECT that the witnesses who did testify weren't particularly convincing. The prosecution also failed to identify a motive for the crime, which further weakened the case. After all, as Paragoy put it, people don't just shoot each other for the hell of it. And while Beatty's courtroom behavior during his initial appearance didn't exactly speak well to his character, he had no criminal history. All things considered, it was hard to believe that a man with no priors, a family to feed, and no reason to kill Woodley would suddenly decide to shoot him in cold blood one day. The jury found Beatty not guilty, leaving Whitley's family feeling betrayed and led down by the justice system, and understandably so. They remain convinced that he got away with murder, and sadly, there's nothing they can do about it. 5. Cameron McDermott Trust fun baby Cameron McDermott likely wasn't familiar with the concept of consequences when he was arrested in early 2017 for allegedly exposing himself to women in Long Island, New York. In one incident, the 32-year-old was accused of approaching a victim in a college parking lot while dressed as a woman. He urinated on her leg while she gave him directions. During a consensual search of McDermott's phone, police found enough suspicious material to secure a warrant to search his home and other electronic devices. Detectives were shocked to discover a series of videos that appeared to show the accused creep assaulting two unconscious victims at his Manhattan apartment on multiple occasions between 2010 and 2013. In the footage, McDermott could be seen flicking one of the women to show that she was unconscious. Both victims told law enforcement that they knew McDermott very well and that they had no recollection of the assaults. In addition to the disturbing homemade videos, investigators found a trove of other illegal content. The material was meticulously sorted and categorized, indicating that McDermott was deeply devoted to his illicit hobbies. At the very least, it was clear that he didn't feel one ounce of guilt for being a sick predator who preyed on innocent victims in some of the worst imaginable ways. And he didn't seem to go out of his way to hide his criminal creations, because he most likely thought that law and order was something that only applied to average people. McDermott was hit with more than 200 criminal counts in multiple counties, including assault, abuse, and unlawful surveillance. He could have faced up to 25 years in prison, but chose to take a generous plea deal, which came with a 10-year prison sentence. As part of the agreement, he was required to admit in court that he targeted his victims when they were in a completely helpless state, and now his criminal record will follow him around for the rest of his life. 4. Yulia Pugachev When someone's popularity goes to their head, they tend to gain an unwarranted sense of superiority, and in some cases they even start to think they're above the law. That seemed to be the case for 28-year-old Yulia Pugachev, a Florida-based influencer who was busted in October 2023 for modifying her Dodge Charger to resemble a police car. According to news reports, Pugachev pulled out all the stops when it came to tricking out her ride, which was even equipped with lights and sirens. She was also accused of having the car painted in an identical color scheme to the vehicles that are used by the Florida Highway Patrol, FHP. 
Pugachev's arrest came after officers noticed her car whizzing by at high speed during an unrelated traffic stop in Miami. They pulled the young woman over and quickly noticed that the phony cop car was adorned with a decal resembling a police badge, along with the words, to protect and serve. The vehicle was also decorated with the name of Pugachev's private security company, FSO Guard. According to authorities, Pugachev initially claimed that she was test driving the car, but eventually admitted that she owned the vehicle. She allegedly told police that she used the car as part of a fleet of vehicles she owned for her security business. An officer told news reporters that the influencer claimed that she had the car painted like a highway patrol vehicle because she fell in love with the color scheme that the police use for their official vehicles. But if you've seen it, the design is pretty drab and unappealing. In addition to being arrested on suspicion of trying to impersonate a cop, Pugachev was accused of using an invalid license plate. She was charged with misdemeanor counts of operating an unregistered motor vehicle, misusing a dealer license plate, and engaging in the imitation of the FHP marked unit. 3. Jim Lucas Gun control is a touchy topic in America these days, with supporters of stricter laws believing that society is better off with fewer guns, period. But those who oppose heightened legislation argue that stricter laws would make it harder for law-abiding citizens to defend themselves in moments of life-threatening danger. Indiana State Representative Jim Lucas is a member of the pro-gun camp, and he didn't hesitate to make this known while speaking with a group of high schoolers who advocated for gun reform during a visit to the State House in early 2024. During his debate with a handful of young women, Lucas drove his point home by revealing the holstered gun that he was carrying inside his suit coat. As he flashed the firearm, he stated in a matter-of-fact tone, I'm carrying right now. One of the students told Lucas that seeing his gun didn't make her feel any safer and that it actually made her feel threatened. Lucas dismissed the adolescent's fears, saying, Those are feelings. I'm talking facts. People that want to kill you don't care about your feelings. Footage of the conversation went viral on social media, with commenters who share Lucas's pro-gun sentiments defending his stance. Some even went as far as mocking the teens for being afraid of guns. Others found the representative's behavior inappropriate or at least questionable. This was especially true since the incident came on the heels of Lucas' arrest months earlier for driving drunk and leaving the scene of a crash. A few weeks after the controversial discussion, Lucas made a surprising move by contacting the State House and saying that he disapproved of the negative comments that some social media users were making toward the teenagers. He offered to pay for the students and their families to take a gun safety course taught by a female certified firearms instructor. And by doing this, he was essentially saying that it was one of the best ways for a gun safety advocate to practice what they preach. McKinna Fivecoats, who filmed the viral video, said that she appreciated the offer but wasn't interested. She mentioned that several members of her family own guns and that she isn't afraid of firearms due to a lack of knowledge on how to use them. The teen went on to explain that she believes that people who don't want to have guns should be able to peacefully coexist alongside people who do want them. Her main point was that her life shouldn't be in danger just because she chooses not to own or use a gun. And in all fairness, it's hard to argue with that logic. 2. James Rackover In late 2016, 26-year-old Joey Comunal traveled from his home in Stamford, Connecticut, to Manhattan for a night out with friends. The group partied at a nightclub until closing time at 4 a.m., then headed to an after-party at the apartment of a man named James Rackover. When Joey failed to show up for a family dinner the next afternoon and wasn't answering his phone, his loved ones knew something was wrong. During their frantic search for the young man, they spoke with a woman who had attended the after-party with him. She said that she last saw Joey re-entering the building after he walked her to a taxi as she left the party. Another friend, Lawrence DeLeon, insisted that Joey never came back to the apartment after he walked the woman outside. His account seemed to align with the version of events given by another attendee, Max Gemma, who said that he fell asleep drunk and that the apartment was empty when he woke up. While reviewing the movements of the apartment's owner, James Rackover, police immediately noticed he was behaving strangely. 
He approached detectives in the building's lobby as they tried obtaining surveillance footage from the night of Joey's disappearance and said good luck getting that video. On another occasion, early on in the search, he said to a detective, good thing I spoke to my girlfriend last night. She says I was in the apartment all night, as if to taunt the cop about having an alibi. But police did obtain the footage, and it proved that Rackover did leave the building, contrary to his claims. When investigators asked him where he went, he reportedly lost his temper. The video also showed Joey re-entering the building, disproving Lawrence DeLeon's claims that he left and never came back. While rummaging through the building's garbage, police found blood-soaked towels inside a comforter bag with Rackover's name on it, along with Joey's ID and credit cards. More evidence turned up during a search of Rackover's apartment, including a large amount of blood that had been cleaned up. When put under pressure during questioning, Dillion admitted that Joey was dead and revealed the location of his body in a shallow grave in the New Jersey woods. He'd been stabbed to death and had other injuries indicating that his killers had tried to dismember his body. Joey also had multiple broken bones, leading detectives to believe his body had been thrown out of Rackover's apartment window onto the sidewalk below. Dilio admitted to punching Joey during a fight over drugs at the after party, but claimed that Rackover was the killer. Authorities charged both men with second-degree murder, and the defendants pointed the finger at each other throughout their court proceedings. A witness claimed that Rackover bragged about committing the murder, while a dented ring that was found at the crime scene pointed toward DeLeon's possible guilt. Rackover was ultimately found guilty of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 28 years to life in prison. DeLeon pleaded guilty to a reduced manslaughter charge and received a 23-year sentence. Rackover continues to maintain his innocence, insisting that he only helped dispose of Joey's body. But he has failed to clear his name in court and remains behind bars as a convicted killer. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Jason Derrick Brown when someone from a respectable upbringing becomes a career criminal, it's natural to wonder what caused them to go rogue. It's a question that's still being asked about Jason Derrick Brown, who abandoned his existence as a devout Mormon and a legitimate businessman for a luxurious lifestyle that he couldn't afford on an honest income. Nobody seems to know exactly when Brown turned to crime as a way to rake in more cash. In hindsight, authorities realized that he may have gotten his start with a string of petty thefts and home invasions that occurred in and around Salt Lake City during the early 2000s. What they do know for sure is that Brown was falsely portraying himself as wealthy when, in reality, both of the businesses he owned were struggling. By 2004, he defaulted on at least one large loan and was, at minimum, tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Investigators now believe that Brown committed large-scale bank and check fraud for years before he fell under their radar. He bought multiple luxury vehicles using fake identities and orchestrated various other illicit schemes, all for the sake of maintaining his upscale image. In November 2004, Brown bought a Glock 45 pistol and enrolled in a gun safety course. His instructor would later describe him as an obnoxious and inexperienced student who accidentally shot someone's vehicle and had to pay for damages. At the time, Brown was living in a motel in Arizona. Within weeks of buying his handgun, he allegedly ambushed a 24-year-old armored truck driver named Robert Keith Palomares outside a movie theater in Phoenix and shot him in the head five times. He gave the victim no opportunity to defend himself, and sadly, Palomares was killed at the scene. The gunman stole a bag containing $56,000 in cash and ran into a nearby alley, where he fled on a waiting bicycle. Investigators identified Brown as the prime suspect in the case several days later through fingerprints that were lifted off the bike. State authorities issued a warrant for his arrest on charges of first-degree murder and armed robbery, but by then, Brown had gotten a five-day head start. He was nowhere to be found, prompting federal authorities to issue an arrest warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. 
After examining Brown's ailing finances, investigators concluded that his desperation for money motivated him to commit the horrific crime. As they traced his movements, they discovered that it fled to Nevada, where he swapped his BMW out for a Cadillac Escalade, and that it parked in a storage unit ahead of Palomares' murder. From there, Brown drove to Orange County, California, where he stayed briefly with relatives. Just two days after the murder, law enforcement was very close to capturing Brown, but they made the regrettable mistake of publicly identifying Brown as the suspect in order to satisfy the public's demand for information. This, unfortunately, gave the fleeing fugitive a last-minute opportunity to stay one step ahead of the authorities. The FBI descended on the relative's property less than an hour after Brown fled, and it was just enough time for him to throw the feds off his trail. His credit card activity placed him in San Diego and Portland, Oregon, before his movements went completely cold. A few months later, investigators found one of Brown's vehicles abandoned in the long-term parking lot at the Portland airport. In the meantime, dozens of tips poured in from the public but the information failed to bring law enforcement any closer to locating Brown. Authorities cited the fugitive's surfer dude appearance, his ability to blend in seamlessly with the crowd, and his striking resemblance to actor Sean Penn as the reasons for the overwhelming number of tips they received, most of which proved to be false. On one occasion, one of Sean Penn's body doubles was even arrested in a case of mistaken identity. In late 2007, the FBI placed Brown in its top 10 list of wanted refugees. He remained there until 2022 and is still wanted more than 20 years after his alleged crime. That same year, Brown's brother David pled guilty to a federal count of lying to the FBI after it was proven in court that he knew more about Jason's disappearance than he was admitting to. It became clear that he most likely aided in his brother's flight from justice. Despite his own trouble with the law, David failed to cough up any useful details regarding Jason's whereabouts, and the former Mormon missionary turned most wanted fugitive remains on the run to this day. It may seem like Brown got away with murder, and that's not an entirely untrue statement but the authorities have never stopped looking for him, and wherever he is, he's living with the constant knowledge that law enforcement remains dedicated to finding and capturing him. It must be a stressful existence to say the least, and there's still a chance that justice will catch up with the 54-year-old. 11. Austin Hayes A disturbing lawsuit filed in early 2023 is accusing former West Virginia delegate Austin Hayes of abusing his position to request favors from a woman in exchange for helping to get a bill passed. According to court filings, the woman, identified only as Jane Doe, was an unpaid lobbyist and citizen advocate who began working to pass a Native American tribal recognition bill in the state legislature in 2019. The complaint claims that Hayes began messaging her on Facebook that year, promising to pass the bill if he won the 2020 election. After securing his victory, Hayes and the woman exchanged phone numbers and began discussing the bill regularly. He never introduced it as promised, yet continued to make contact with Jane Doe. Hayes is accused of taking an intrusive tone with his correspondence starting in 2021, when he began asking the woman some personal questions. She avoided answering the questions and tried to redirect the conversation back to appropriate topics, but Hayes allegedly only came on stronger with his unwelcome statements. According to the official complaints, the plaintiff once again avoided answering, and Hayes apologized to her the following day. The woman claimed that he escalated his behavior into late-night phone calls and that he would sit silently on the other end when she answered. Based on reports from the West Virginia record, Hayes messaged Jane Doe the next day, claiming that he wasn't encouraging her to sleep around in order to get the bill passed, but that he was making her aware of what happens sometimes. The lawsuit alleges that he abused his position and continued to harass the woman, even after she clearly tried to keep their interactions professional. The accusations against Hayes first came to light during his 2022 re-election bid, which he ended up losing after more women came forward with similar allegations. 10. J. Brett Blanton A damning report that was released by the U.S. architect of the Capitol's Inspector General's office in late 2022 
revealed that one of its own had habitually abused his position, misused government property, and wasted taxpayer dollars for at least a two-year period. The findings came to light after a complaint from a civilian prompted the agency to launch an investigation against architect of the Capitol, J. Brett Blanton, in 2021. According to the caller, someone behind the wheel of an official AOC vehicle drove recklessly in a parking garage in Vienna, Virginia, reaching speeds of up to 65 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone. Investigators discovered that the vehicle was being driven by Blanton's daughters, which constituted unauthorized use, and that it apparently wasn't an isolated incident. The report alleged that Blanton and his family regularly used AOC vehicles for personal errands and weekend trips as far away as Florida, receiving at least $12,000 worth of unentitled benefits in the form of transportation, gas, and other costs. Even more shockingly, Blanton was accused of misrepresenting himself as a law enforcement official by activating the lights and siren on his vehicle. After a fender bender in 2021, he allegedly identified himself as an agent to the other driver involved in the crash and said that he didn't have insurance information, but that the government would handle the claim. On another occasion, witnesses claimed that Blanton chased a car using his AOC vehicle's emergency equipment after it hit his daughter's boyfriend's car in front of the family home. A police report listed him as an off-duty DC cop, and he continued with court proceedings without correcting the misconception that he was a police officer. The agency that conducted the report declined to press charges and referred the findings to other government agencies for any recourse they might want to take. 9. Mary O'Connor Tampa Police Chief Mary O'Connor and her husband were riding their golf cart without a license plate one evening when they were approached by Pinellas County Deputy Larry Jacoby. During their conversation with the deputy, O'Connor asked him if his body cam was recording prompting Jacoby to confirm that it was. O'Connor then quickly flashed her badge and identified herself as the Tampa Police Chief, then said, I'm hoping you'll just let us go tonight. The deputy let the pair go. Before parting ways, however, O'Connor handed Jacoby her card and said, call me if you ever need anything, seriously. She likely wasn't expecting people to find out about the incident, but they did and she admitted that her way of handling things could be viewed as inappropriate. In a statement, O'Connor said that she'd express great remorse to the mayor, and she apologized to Tampa's residents for her poor judgment. She further added that she didn't mean to put the deputy in an uncomfortable position and offered to pay any citations that her mistakes warranted. O'Connor requested the same discipline that any officer would receive for similar conduct. But her remorse wasn't enough to fix the situation, and O'Connor ultimately resigned from her position. 8. Dennis Baptista After receiving a call from a concerned motorist about an erratic driver one evening in 2014, New Jersey State Trooper Josh Ladeo spotted a vehicle matching the description the caller had provided. He followed the car and noticed that it was drifting between lanes, so he conducted a traffic stop. In a recorded conversation, Ladeo could be heard asking the driver, later identified as Phillipsburg Municipal Court Judge Dennis Baptista, if he'd been drinking that evening. Baptista told the trooper that he was a lawyer on his way home from work and that he hadn't had anything to drink. According to court documents, Ladeo noticed a distinct odor of alcohol on the driver's breath. During a field sobriety test, he observed other possible signs of intoxication, including slurred speech, slow movements, and glassy eyes. Baptista allegedly lost his balance and had to lean on his vehicle to stay on his feet at multiple points throughout the test. An audio recording of the interaction revealed that Baptista repeatedly asked Ladeo if they were past the point of the trooper being able to decide against arresting him. He also mentioned that he's a public figure and how a DUI charge would hurt him more than the average guy. But it was Baptista's decision to drive drunk and to mention that he's a judge that really hurt him, not Trooper Ladeo's decision to arrest him for appearing to be intoxicated. Baptista ultimately pleaded guilty to DUI and was also disciplined for using his position to advance his private interests, which goes against the state's judicial code of conduct. He was censured or issued a written reprimand 
for his professional misconduct and was barred from hearing DUI cases for a year. The judge also revoked Bangtista's driving license for three months and ordered him to attend drunk driving classes on top of paying a penalty. 7. Peter Leckie In 2022, authorities in British Columbia announced charges against Royal Canadian Police Corporal Peter Leckie for an alleged history of misconduct dating back nearly seven years. A Surrey RCMP complaint claims that Leckie used his position as a police officer to obtain information about members of the public who he contacted both on and off duty for the purpose of engaging in intimate relationships. The original charges, which included assault, computer fraud, and breach of trust, were connected to three victims and spanned a time period lasting from early 2014 to October 2020. Police then published Leckie's photo with the expectation that more women might come forward. Several months later, a handful of new charges against him were announced, including assault, breach of trust, and fraudulently obtaining computer services. Lecky, who's been with the RCMP since 2010, remains suspended without pay pending the outcomes of the cases, which consist of 14 criminal charges in total. The exact circumstances surrounding his alleged crimes are unclear, as authorities have released few details to the public so far. In a statement, Surrey RCMP Assistant Commissioner Brian Edwards described the allegations against Leckie as disturbing and encouraged anyone else who may have been targeted to come forward, suggesting that the scandal may be far from over. 6. Vanessa Gibson In what began as a routine traffic stop one day in 2014, NYPD officer Michelle Hernandez pulled a female driver over in the Bronx for talking on her cell phone while behind the wheel. Hernandez was likely unaware, at least at the beginning of the interaction, that the driver was city councilwoman Vanessa Gibson. During the stop, Gibson called Deputy Inspector Kevin Catalina, the commanding officer of the 44th Precinct, who instructed a desk officer to tell Hernandez not to issue a ticket. When Hernandez returned to Gibson's car, she handed the officer her phone. Catalina reportedly instructed the cop to issue a verbal warning rather than write a ticket and reminded her that Gibson was the head of the public safety committee. Hernandez complied and the ticket against Gibson was voided, but the situation made her uncomfortable enough to keep a copy of the cancelled citation. The city charter dictates that elected officials should be held to a higher standard of compliance with the law, and it forbids them from using their position for personal advantage. Hernandez mentioned the incident in a lawsuit accusing the NYPD of unlawful performance goals that she claimed required her to perform excessive arrests and searches. While the lawsuit was dismissed, the allegation against Gibson stuck. She denied explicitly asking Catalina not to issue a ticket, but admitted that she should have just accepted the summons and handled the situation like every other civilian is expected to when they get caught breaking a traffic law. As a result, Gibson was fined $5,000 for trying to avoid the ticket, which was a violation that comes with a maximum $50 fine and five license points for first-time offenders. 5. Carter Williams West Virginia Circuit Judge C. Carter Williams was on his way home from a family outing to get ice cream one day in 2021 when Moorfield Police Officer Dear Vonta Johnson pulled him over for having his cell phone in his hand while driving. According to charging documents that were later filed against Williams, he angrily asked Officer Johnson why he was being stopped. The first time Johnson asked the judge for his license, registration, and insurance, Williams allegedly said he'd done nothing wrong. So, the officer asked for the documents again, and Williams outright said that he wasn't going to hand them over. He eventually gave Johnson the documents, though, after commenting on how he sees police officers using their phones behind the wheel all the time, something Johnson said they were allowed to do when it was related to their job duties. At some point, the cop asked Williams why he was so uptight, and the judge said it was because he'd been pulled over for no reason. While Johnson was running the license, which he soon realized had expired months earlier, Williams called Moorfield Police Lieutenant Melody Burrows, who was off duty at the time. Burrows radioed Johnson and told him not to write a ticket. As the officer returned to the vehicle and tried to tell Williams that his license was expired, the judge allegedly grabbed his documents out of the cop's hat and drove off. 
Later that evening, Williams called Moorfield Police Chief Stephen Riggleman and said he was tired of being disrespected. Riggleman, however, told the judge that if anyone was being disrespectful, it was him. Williams ultimately hung up on the police chief and proceeded to call the former police chief, Steve Reckart, who reminded Williams that he'd retired. The disgruntled judge said that he needed someone to talk to, which Reckart reportedly found odd because they weren't close friends. The night finally ended after Williams made yet another call to Lieutenant Burroughs and berated the police force, saying he'd never been treated so poorly. He then drove to the local mayor's house, where he administered another irrationally angry diatribe. An ensuing investigation uncovered an alleged pattern of Williams using his position to get away with violating traffic laws. Prior incidents included running a stop sign, driving with an expired registration, and not having a seatbelt fastened. A judicial hearing board recommended a three-month unpaid suspension and a $5,000 fine along with orders for Williams to pay $11,000 in case-related costs. It also suggested extending the suspension for up to a year if Williams violates the conditions put forth by the terms of the agreement. 4. Nancy Cantor Rutgers University Newark Chancellor Nancy Cantor was on her way to Newark Liberty International Airport one day in 2019 when her driver hit a parked campus police car. Footage from the ensuing conversation with law enforcement appeared to show a cop struggling to explain to Cantor that he had to take information about the accident, saying, we have to do our job, just like you have to do your job. When an officer asked to see her ID, she argued that she wasn't driving instead of just handing it over. At one point during the video, Cantor could be heard saying, if I miss my plane, you folks are in trouble, I'm the chancellor. She then said that she would love to see them do that to the school's president. Another staff member instructed the officer to take a picture and let her go, adding, Would you do this to the president of the United States? No, no, you wouldn't. After the clip was leaked several months later, Cantor apologized to the Rutgers University Police Department for her behavior after the fender bender, stating that she wasn't her best self that day. She then expressed gratitude to the department for keeping the campus and community safe and secure. The police department and campus officials accepted Cantor's apology and seemed perfectly happy to just move on from the situation, sparing her from any serious repercussions. Perhaps the leaked footage of her embarrassing behavior was punishment enough. 3. Sarah Louise Johnston when 50-year-old off-duty police sergeant Sarah Louise Johnston encountered a random breathing test or RBT site in Sydney, Australia in 2016, she asked the rookie officers running the stop if they were really going to test her. They recognized who she was but had no plans to treat her differently from any other civilian who passed through the checkpoint. Johnston allegedly tried to tell one of the officers that breath testing her would be a conflict of interest, adding, imagine if I blew over, which I won't. She was also later accused of telling the young cop that it would put him in an awkward situation. The two officers manning the checkpoint reported Johnston's misconduct, and she was held criminally responsible for her actions. Throughout the case, it came to light that she'd been out celebrating the new year with two colleagues and was driving home after drinking at least one glass of beer. In court, one of the officers who dealt with Johnston during the stop said that he felt manipulated by his higher-ranking colleague and that her behavior came across as a little aggressive. He also explained that the way Johnston acted made him second-guess himself and believe that he was wrong for subjecting her to a random test. Regardless of whether or not Johnston was drunk, the judge said she set a disgraceful example as someone who's expected to be an honest and upstanding member of the community. He also told Johnston that she brought shame upon herself and to all honest members of the police force, and he commended the officers who reported her for coming forward. Johnston was found guilty of using her position and rang to avoid being breath tested and was sentenced to 16 months in jail with the requirement to spend at least a year behind bars before becoming eligible for parole. 2. Karen Z. Turner After serving as a financial advisor to Hillary Clinton, Karen Z. Turner became a commissioner with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. She also served as a chairwoman of the agency's ethics committee. 
Her previously impeccable professional record was blemished in April 2018 when she was called to help resolve a matter between police in Tenafly, New Jersey, and her daughter, who was apparently unable to provide proof of insurance or registration when she was pulled over. Cringe-worthy body cam footage showed Turner demanding details about the traffic stop that the police politely told her they weren't required to provide since her daughter and everyone else in the car was over 18. In the video, Turner could be heard ordering the cops to call her commissioner rather than miss. Based on a police report, an officer advised her to speak with the driver of the car, her daughter, for the information she was seeking. The report further described Turner's conduct as attempting to misappropriately use her professional position to gain authority in this situation. An officer tried to end the conversation, at which point Turner told him to shut the F up. She then warned him that she would be speaking with the local mayor about the incident. Afterward, someone alerted the Port Authority to the situation, prompting an investigation to be launched. Instead of waiting to learn the outcome, Turner resigned from her position. In a statement, a Port Authority spokesperson described her actions as indefensible and said that the agency has zero tolerance for ethics violations. The same ethics committee that Turner used to be the leader of then censured her for outrageous and profoundly disturbing conduct. By then, she'd already left her position, but the symbolic gesture will hopefully serve as an example to other high-ranking Port Authority officials about how this type of behavior won't be tolerated. Chairman Kevin O'Toole said that if Turner hadn't resigned, the board would have demanded for her to step down. 1. Steve Marks In early 2023, the Associated Press got its hands on an internal investigation report from the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, which found that its director, Steve Marks, and five of his top deputies used their position to obtain highly coveted bourbon that members of the public compete for the opportunity to purchase in a state-run lottery. The bottles, which can cost thousands of dollars each and include 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle whiskey, were diverted to Marks and his colleagues, depriving other paying customers of the opportunity to buy the upscale booze. The investigation ruled that the suspects abused their positions and violated state statutes, including a policy that bans public officials from using confidential information for personal gain. Oregon Governor Tina Kotek called for the removal of Marx and the other officials who were implicated in the scandal, describing their behavior as wholly unacceptable. Marx denied violating ethics laws and state policies, but acknowledged that he received some level of preferential treatment in obtaining the whiskey. He and the co-accused officials denied ever reselling the bottles. Before the findings were uncovered, Governor Kotek had already asked Marks to step down from his position as part of her bid to reorganize state agency leadership. In accordance with her request, he submitted his resignation letter after the scandal broke. Kotek has since called for the firing of any top-level managers within the Liquor Commission who sought preferential treatment in their attempts to obtain liquor. Would you rather be so confident that you attract all sorts of unwanted attention or be a little more timid and be able to fly under people's radar? Let us know what you think in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.